In general chemistry, most inorganic compounds you run into are named using the same basic system, something somethingide. The formulas of ionic compounds are usually written cation first, anion second. When you name the compound, the name of the cation is just the name of the cation. The name of the anion uses an IDE suffix, if the anion is monatomic. More about polyatomic ions a little bit later. These are the eight most common monatomic anions you run into and how we add the IDE suffix. So a compound made up of lithium and fluorine we call lithium fluoride. A compound made up of sodium and oxygen we call sodium oxide. And a compound made up of magnesium and nitrogen we call magnesium nitride. And for a lot of compounds you run into, this is all the information you need in the name to go the other way around, from name to formula. With magnesium nitride, for example, we know that magnesium is in group 2A, so it's going to have a plus 2 charge most of the time. Nitrogen is in group 5A, so it's usually going to have a negative 3 charge. You do the crossover method, you get the formula. Any other information in the name would just clutter up the name and not really be necessary. When the cation is from a variable charge element, you have to tweak the naming system a little bit. Take these two copper chlorine compounds, for instance. Going by everything we've done so far, the compound on the left would be called copper chloride. But that's also what we'd call the compound on the right. You can't have two compounds with the same name, though. It would be way too confusing. So the modern way to fix this problem is to include the charge of the metal as a Roman numeral. So looking back at the first compound on the left, chlorine is a constant charge element. It usually has a negative one charge. So copper must be plus one in this case, so we'd call it copper one chloride. And the compound on the right, copper has a plus two charge, so we call it copper two chloride. Looking at a couple of examples where you go from name to formula, in iron two sulfide, the iron two tells us that iron has a plus two charge. Sulfur is a constant charge element, so it usually has a negative two charge being in group six which means this compound must be one to one. And iron three sulfide, iron three tells us that we're dealing with iron three plus. Again, sulfur is a constant charge element. It's gonna have a negative two charge. You do the crossover method, you get a two to three ratio. Just remember, you only need to use Roman numerals when you're dealing with variable charge elements. You don't need to use them for constant charge elements as we saw in our first three examples. You didn't need to call LIF lithium-1 fluoride because lithium's in group 1A. It's usually plus 1, just like sodium and sodium oxide. Magnesium's an alkaline earth metal. It's usually plus 2, so there's no need to say magnesium-2 nitride. The Roman numerals just clutter up the name in those cases. You also tweak the naming system a little bit when you have a polyatomic anion. If the anion is polyatomic, you're going to keep the original name as you learned it. There's a simple reason for this. Phosphate, for example, is the name we give the anion PO4-3-. If you were to change the name to phosphide, then that would confuse it for the monatomic ion P3-. So a compound made up of potassium and sulfate ions we would call potassium sulfate. A compound made up of nickel-2 and nitrate ion we would call nickel-2 nitrate. Again, notice the use of Roman numerals to tell us the charge of nickel, which is a variable charge element. Finally, if a compound made up of ammonium and perchlorate ions, we would call ammonium perchlorate. Most inorganic covalent compounds that you encounter in general chemistry are made up of two nonmetals. So you name them starting with the same general naming system we used for ionic compounds, something somethingide. The name of the first element you see in the formula is just the name of the element. The name of the second element in the formula uses the IDE suffix. Only with covalent compounds, we also include prefixes, so you know how many of each element is present in the formula. These are the first 10 prefixes that we use. A lot of them are probably already familiar to you. Like three is tri, triangle, tricycle, eight is octa, octagon, 10 is deca, decade. One note about mono, however. Mono is rarely used when there's only one of that element shown in the formula. You will sometimes see it for the second element, like in carbon monoxide, but most of the time, if there's only one, you don't bother with a prefix. The lack of a prefix just implies there's only one. Kind of like in a formula, the lack of a subscript implies that there's only one. So, for example, the compound with the formula of PCL3 would be called phosphorus trichloride. 
PCL5 would be called phosphorus pentachloride. Going the other way from name to formula, sulfur hexafluoride would mean one sulfur, six fluorines. Disulfur decafluoride means two sulfurs, ten fluorines. Just remember, you only need to use prefixes for covalent compounds. You don't need them when you're naming ionic compounds because you have the crossover method to give you the correct formula. So to sum it all up, most compounds you encounter in general chemistry follow the same general naming system, something somethingide. You just have to tweak it for certain cases. With variable charge elements, you have to use a Roman numeral to show what the charge is in that particular compound. If the anion is polyatomic, you're going to keep the original name. You're not going to use IDE. And if it's a covalent compound, you're going to use prefixes.